The biggest military operation in history turned out to be one of the biggest turning points in the Second World War. I'm talking about Operation Barbarossa. Many books have been written about it and the history seems therefore almost set in stone. But actually, there might be a few myths that you still hang on to. In this video, we're going to talk about the myths of Operation Barbarossa, the biggest operation in military history. Stay tuned. Hey, good to have you back on the channel. And if you're new, my name is Stefan, I'm a history teacher from the Netherlands and I'm hustling history for you. And if you liked it, then please consider subscribing and hit that notification bell. According to the mainstream narrative, the Red Army was not motivated from the get go. And to prove this, well, we can say that the Germans took over 400,000 Soviet prisoners of war in the initial weeks of Operation Barbarossa. But therefore, you cannot state that the Red Army was not motivated. Sure, some troops had low morale. Think of ethnic Baltic and Ukrainian troops. These people had suffered the hardships of Stalin. And furthermore, they also had national sentiments. They wanted to create their own state. And especially the Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian and West Ukrainians who had only recently endured the hardship of Stalin's totalitarian rule. Yes, these troops were willing to throw away their weapons immediately and surrender or desert. But when we talk about the bulk of the Red Army, which consisted of Russians and Belarusians, these fought till the last bullet. An important example was the Battle of the Brest Fortress. While the German army passed the fortress, the Soviet soldiers inside the fortress held out for a month. Some soldiers wrote inscriptions on the walls inside the fortress like, I'm dying, but I won't surrender. Farewell, motherland. It is true that because of Stalin's purges, many officers were replaced by incompetent officers. And sure, these might have applied the wrong tactics or surrendered right away. But that does not make the entire Red Army and the average Red Army soldier low morale. Because of the German Blitzkrieg, many troops became encircled and eventually did surrender, but not until the last bullet was fired. A German report stated the following. What has become of the Russian of 1914-1917 who ran away or approached us with hands in the air when the firestorm reached its peak? Now he remains in his bunker and forces us to burn him out. He prefers to be scorched with his tank and his airmen continue firing at us even when their own aircraft is set ablaze. What has become of the Russian? Ideology has changed him. And it sure had. At some point, the Germans, they brought in white emigres to convince the pockets of Red Army soldiers to surrender, which was categorically refused. The white emigres were Russians that had fled during the Russian Civil War, that fought against the Reds and weren't captured and made it out alive. And these men now tried to convince the huge pockets of Red Army soldiers to surrender. But this was categorically refused. Many believe that the Russian winner is to blame for the fact that the Germans were halted in their tracks, and therefore couldn't take Moscow and thus Operation Barbarossa had failed. Yet, this is not the case. Sure, the Germans suffered tremendously by the cold. Sure, there was a lack of winter uniforms, but it wasn't the fault of the winter that the Germans weren't able to take Moscow. It's the same as if you try to achieve something and because of several factors, it fails. Some factors are your own fault, other are external factors. And then you blame the external factors that you weren't successful. Now, why such myth as defeat by the Russian winter still exists, I'll discuss later. First, let's debunk this myth. Early December, the Germans marched on Moscow as the Red Army launched a counterattack. One week later, the Germans were routed by the Soviet onslaught. When the Soviets counterattacked, temperatures fell below 35 degrees Celsius, which was exceptionally cold. But get this, the Soviet attacks in these days were not successful. As Soviet General Zhukov admitted, 
we failed during the first days. Then we get to December 8th and we see the temperatures rise to around 0 degrees. It was then that the Soviet counterattack was finally successful and this was due to the fact that the Wehrmacht troops had been in combat for months and were psychologically worn out and believed their opponent was on the brink of collapse. As soon as the Soviet counterattack gained momentum, German morale collapsed and the retreat became a rout. And the Soviets capitalized on this and pushed the Germans away further and further until Hitler issued his standfast order mid-December. The Soviet Union had more troops and therefore won the war. This can also be considered a myth. As a German commander stated that the German army was like a rock that was drowned under endless Soviet waters. So it implies that the Soviets had endless amount of soldiers and just threw in the numbers and eventually proclaimed victory. This is also stated by many German eyewitness accounts like this one. The Dutch volunteer that served in the Waffen SS. He also stated that he just mowed down Soviet attack after Soviet attack. But you know, that's the thing of memoirs. You kind of overstate and exaggerate your own successes. But did the Soviets really have more troops? When Operation Barbarossa started, the Soviet troops in the western district between the Baltic and the Black Sea had 2.3 million men opposed to nearly 4.5 million Axis troops. German Wehrmacht alone had over 3 million men, which already exceeds the amount of Soviet soldiers in the west. Furthermore, if you look at the end of the operation, the battle for Moscow, the Soviets in the area mustered 576,500 soldiers and 574 tanks against German Army Group Center, which at that time had between 1.2 and 1.9 million troops with 1,800 tanks and assault guns. The Germans had at least a two-fold numerical superiority in manpower and a three-fold numerical superiority in tanks. As the war went on, the Germans lost their numerical superiority, but that for sure was not the case in 1941 when Operation Barbarossa took place. So the question remains, how did we get to these wrong perceptions? Well, this was due to factors during and factors after the war. First during. The most prominent images that were shown during the war about the Eastern Front came from German propaganda and these images kept lingering after the war was over. If we take a look at after the war, after the war things changed because now there was the Cold War. The Soviet Union was no longer an ally but the enemy. The Soviet Union was the opponent and Germany or Western Germany so to say was now an ally. So therefore most Western historians made use of German sources, like German general Franz Halder, who wrote about the war. And these were used as a source. The generals themselves didn't blame their own mistakes. They either blamed it on Hitler or external factors. And one important factor we should also not overlook was the factor of language. When you compare the Russian and the German language, the German language is much more closely related to the English language. So because of these reasons, post-war Western historians mostly made use of German sources. Sources that boost their own successes and blame failures on external factors like the Russian winner or the numerical superiority of the Soviets. Thanks to my patrons you see on screen and a special thanks to Henry Clarkson and One Bad Cookie. If you want to support me, please go to the link in the description. Please consider becoming a patron because with your donations I can keep doing this and expand. Now if you want to learn more about the end of the Eastern Front, yeah we're gonna go all the way to the end now, you can click right here. Thank you so much for watching, do not forget to subscribe, and share and all that kind of stuff. See you later.